have seen the Lord. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on your people. Melt us, mold us, fill us, and then use us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Resurrection Sunday is here. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Wait, not so fast. There is absolutely too much going on this year to just exclaim Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed, while ignoring the just position of pain in our communities due to COVID-19, poor race relations in our country exemplified by a public murder trial currently in progress, hatred toward Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, ongoing gun violence, mass shootings on top of our own stuff. What does Christ has risen really mean to us in the midst of this darkness that we dare not ignore just because it's Easter? I'm grateful for our members who shared this morning the meaning of resurrection for themselves and for their families today. Each of us needs to come to an understanding of our faith and answer the question, what does resurrection mean to me and to my family today? Because if that faith is shaken by darkness in the world, then soon we'll have no faith at all. That might explain the very recent report just last week, Pastor Sarah, from Gallup News that reported that for the first time in eight decades of tracking the data, a majority of, Mer of Americans do not belong to a house of worship. Only 47% of Americans are members of a house of worship, whether it be a church, a mosque, or a synagogue. 47% for the first time is dropped below 50%. This decline, according to Gallup, is tied to a steady increase of Americans who have no religious affiliation at all, now at 21%. People are checking out of religion. And I surmise that the darkness in the world has caused some to doubt the relevancy of religion. So we who are Christians who see the decline by the empty pews need to be very sure, as one songwriter says, that our anchor holds and grips the solid rock. And this rock is Jesus. It is my prayer, it is my very call, as this made me reflect on, on the early days of my call, not to just help people have church, but to help people see Jesus. It's not just to help people have a church experience, but to help people have a God experience to help you know what it means to serve a resurrected savior. Like our members who share today, I pray that you and your family spend some time considering the meaning of the resurrection of Jesus for you in your context. And the reality is that your context and our context is not entirely different from the disciples' context. This narrative of the resurrection story in John involves three disciples, Mary Magdalene, Peter, 
and the disciple only identified as the one Jesus loved. These and others have just witnessed the crucifixion. You can't get to Easter without the darkness of Good Friday. They just witnessed the most horrific death one could die. These disciples walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus, listened to his teachings, watched his miracles, and now they've watched his public execution. We've had some experience this week. If you've been watching the trial of Derek Chauvin, of the trauma of those who were up close and personal to a horrific public murder. We've seen their trauma as witness after witness has described that trauma as they cry on the stand. And maybe some of us haven't seen it because we are too traumatized to watch it ourselves. My sincere prayer is that someone offers the eyewitnesses of George Floyd's death some mental health care, some free mental health care to address their trauma. And if you need yours addressed, my prayer is that you get the help that you need. The disciple, the three, the three disciples in our text were surely traumatized. Now that we know more about trauma than we've ever known, they're, they're surely traumatized by the crucifixion, especially because each had a relationship with Jesus. I believe their personal relationship with Jesus is what made them come looking for his body. And not just looking, but listen to the narrative and, and, and the initial search for Jesus. And in your mind's eye, maybe next year we'll have a dramatization, but in your mind's eye, imagine their anxiety, their trauma, and their grief as you listen to the narrative while it was still dark. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter. And the other disciple, the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, the text says, but the other disciple outran Peter, reached the tomb first, bent over and looked in. But he didn't go in. Peter came dashing past and went straight in. And then the one who hesitated then followed. Mary, Peter, and the disciple Jesus loved were running, almost racing, bending, looking. They reach the tomb. One runs straight in. The other hesitates, goes in. There's a frantic search for the body of Jesus by these three disciples. And of course there is. Of course Mary is looking for Jesus. She is one of his biggest supporters. According to the Gospel of Luke, Mary Magdalene has been blessed and healed by Jesus. She's supported Jesus with her own resources, her money. She believed in his ministry and was part of his inner circle. In a patriarchal world, Jesus did not tell her to go home, but affirmed her as a disciple. Whether the biblical writers wanted to call her that or not, Jesus surely affirmed her as a disciple and affirmed her leadership among his closest followers, Jesus liberated Mary and changed her life. And when someone changed your life like that, you don't just let the worst happen and not go look for them. She was there when he was crucified. She was there when he was buried. And while it was still dark, she came to see after his body because Jesus was important to her because like some of us, Jesus changed her life. Of course, Mary came looking. And of course, Peter is looking for Jesus. Jesus called Peter to be a fisher of men. And Peter followed Jesus from that point forward, experiencing almost every teaching and witnessing almost every miracle, such as when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And when Jesus was walking on the water, he invited Peter to walk on the water and Peter did it. Peter walked on the water with Jesus. Peter, of course he's looking for this Jesus that he walked on water with. And I love Peter because Peter was an active learner. Like some of us, Peter learned by speaking out of turn, acting impulsively, 
and being bold and brave. So he witnessed more from Jesus, perhaps more than the meek and mild. Because as he acted unruly at times, Jesus never stopped loving him but lovingly corrected him or his mistakes like when he cut off the soldier's ear and Jesus healed it immediately. And now Jesus has been crucified and buried and you're saying he's gone? Of course, Peter came looking for Jesus and of course the one that Jesus loved is looking for Jesus. He's been walking and talking with Jesus, experiencing the ministry and the miracles up close and personal. He reclined next to Jesus during the Lord's Supper on Monday, Thursday. Asked Jesus, who is it that's going to betray you? Almost like I'll take care of him, Jesus. Who is he? <laughs> Jesus assigned this disciple to care for his mother as he hung on the cross. And this disciple took Mary, the mother of Jesus, home at that moment. He has gone down in history as the one Jesus loved. That is perplexing to some theologians and some biblical scholars, but it is what it is. He's the one Jesus loved. So there was a bond, a love, a closeness like no other. He was special to Jesus. Of course, the one Jesus loved went looking for Jesus. And how about you? You've been part of the church for 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, stop me when I should stop, years and counting. You're here. But have you been looking for Jesus? Have you been yearning for a connection for the resurrected Jesus? Have you been wanting to see Jesus? Have you been asking for a manifestation of Jesus? You see, Easter is all about a resurrected Jesus. And if I'm a follower of Jesus, I will want to see Jesus. When Mary finally saw Jesus, she went running and told the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And a little while later, after Jesus appeared to some of the disciples, they exclaimed, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas, keeping it real, said, unless I see the mark of nails in his hands. See, some of us keep it real. And put my finger in the mark of nails and my hand in his side. I'm hard, y'all. I need to see all of that, Thomas said, before I believe. And the Bible says a week later, the disciples were together again, and Jesus came in the room, stood among them, and said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And then Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And in these days, while it is still dark, in these days, while the Gallup polls indicate a sharp decline in church membership and in Christianity across the land, in these days when there's an attack on freedom, an attack on rights, attack on our very humanity. These days are over when people can rely on their mama and their daddy's faith. The days are over when you hope that the pastor has seen the Lord. <laughs> if the pastor's seen the Lord, I'll go to that church. Those days are over. The days are over when you're just content if the bishop or the pope has seen the Lord. The days have come where we need to have the urgency and the tenacity of Mary, the boldness of Peter, the loyalty of the disciple that, who loved Jesus, who Jesus loved, and even the directness of Thomas. In these dark days, I submit to you that we need to pursue Jesus until we can say, I have seen the Lord. The prophet Isaiah said it this way, seek the Lord while the Lord may be found. Call upon the Lord while he is near. 
So my hope this Resurrection Sunday is that you find within yourself a hunger to find the resurrected Jesus. My hope this Easter 2021 is that in the midst of darkness, while it's still dark, you look and find the light of the world. But just in case, like the disciples, you need a little help recognizing Jesus, let me tell you about a few times when I exclaimed, like Mary, I have seen the Lord. I have witnessed, particularly in, in seminary, students go from being severely homophobic to come to love and advocate for their LGBTQI friends and community. I have seen it and I have seen the Lord. I have seen a diminishing stigma for both mental health issues and getting mental health care in the black community. Black people who understandably are among the most traumatized people in America are getting help for their longstanding and generational trauma caused by white supremacy, racism, violence, and abuse. God is calling people into ministry and many are seeking the training to help their brothers and sisters with generational trauma. I tell you, we never thought the day would come when black people wouldn't mind getting a therapist, but I have seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord take a gangbanger and make him a community leader with greater connections and access to resources than most clergy. I know him, I know his testimony, and like Thomas said, I say, my Lord and my God, I have seen the Lord. I see the Lord when laws that have led to mass incarceration of black and brown people start changing. I see the Lord, Reverend Al, Al Sharp, in you and people like you who fight and advocate for changing drug laws and who work tirelessly until Illinois became the first state to eliminate cash bail bond. People said it would never happen, but it happened because I have seen the Lord. Speaking of things people thought would never happen, I saw the Lord when the America elected Barack Obama. And then I got to see the Lord again when America elected Kamala Harris. And I've seen the Lord when Georgia elected a black man and a Jewish man to the US Senate in Georgia. I don't know about you, but I have seen the Lord. Even in the darkness of this pandemic, I have seen the Lord, have you? I saw the Lord, Sister Bethany, when one donor gave you enough money to purchase 153 pianos. The word says, ask, and ye shall receive. And sister, you asked. And in a hot moment, you got what you asked for, and households across Chicago are blessed. Because you asked. And, and if you ask Bethany, she'll tell you it was nobody but the Lord. Sister Bethany, have you seen the Lord? She says, I have seen the Lord. I saw the Lord, Brother Elikam, in the life-giving conversation we had just last week about the motherland, Africa about your home country of Ghana, my amazing time of exploration and affirmation in Ghana, and about the hopes and the possibilities that we shared as we spoke. I felt God moving. God bless you, Elikam, and through that conversation, I have seen the Lord. And I want to suggest that you too have seen the Lord. Anytime you see a move towards freedom, towards liberation, you've seen the Lord. The word says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Anytime you experience forgiveness or reconciliation, you've seen the Lord. Anytime you acknowledge not scarcity, but abundance, for there is no lack in God, you have seen the Lord. Anytime equality prevails, goodness prevails, and mercy prevails, please know that you have seen the Lord. Anytime truth prevails, you have seen the Lord. Anytime love prevails, you have seen the Lord. Anytime we as children do what thus says the Lord. 
Anytime we as the body of Christ do justice and love mercy and walk humbly when we practice discipleship, we give of our time and our talent and our treasure for God's people and God's house. And especially when we stand for good and not for evil, the community and the world can say they have seen the Lord through us. These amazing experiences of God's blessings are the results of hard work by followers of Christ who have the tenacity and leadership of Mary the boldness of Peter, the loyalty of the one that Jesus loves, stemming from the manifestation of Jesus in their lives. Jesus is alive through followers of Christ who work tirelessly to bring about justice, to show love for God's people. And this is the resurrected Jesus, for he is alive in you and in me. But before I take my seat, please know that I'm not only speaking of discipleship, because it is my sincere testimony that I have truly seen the Lord for he walks with me and he talks with me. I've seen the Lord for he corrects me and inspires me. I've seen the Lord because he informs me and transforms me. I've seen the Lord because he comforts me and protects me and guides me and heals me. He advocates for me and he defends me. Jesus takes good care of me. So please hear me that this is not all about metaphors. It's not all about discipleship. I have seen the Lord. As much as I have seen and as much as you have seen, it was the apostle Paul who said it best when he said, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, nor has entered into the heart of me. The thing which God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, the best is yet to come. Now we can say, hallelujah, Christ is risen. Now we can say, Christ is risen indeed. God bless you.